Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here at the Center for Global Security Research within the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. My name is Asmar Asquerom, and I'm the Associate Deputy Director of the Center. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Mariana Bajuran, and she's speaking to us about her new book entitled Inheriting the Bomb, the Past and Present of Ukraine's Nuclear Disarmament. The book re-examines the history of the events, the politics, and the decision-making that led to Ukraine's nuclear disarmament in the 1990s. Dr. Mariana Bajuran is a senior research associate with the Project on Managing the Atom at the Belfour Center at the Harvard Kennedy School. She's also a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center. Uh, previously, she was a visiting professor at Tufts University and also at uh, the Peace Research Institute in Frankfurt. Uh, so with uh, all of our past CGSR lectures, our speaker will present for about 30 to 45 minutes, and then we'll turn to the audience for questions. Uh, so Dr. Bajuran, welcome to CGSR. Thank you for taking the time out today. And I'll turn the floor over to you to get us started. All right, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for the kind introduction and for uh, inviting me to to speak to you today about this new book. It just came out in December. Um, so it's a, it's about the talk today is going to be about the past and present of Ukraine's nuclear disarmament. Um, I have it titled here, uh, Ukraine's nuclear disarmament, why it matters. And let me just start um, at the end, which is sort of the easiest part of why uh, why it matters. Um, it matters because there's a major war. There's a ma major land war uh, in Ukraine right now. We're soon uh, in a couple of days approaching, in a few days approaching one year uh, mark um, of that of that invasion unleashed by Russia against Ukraine. Um, it's uh, uh, it's uh, the rate of of conventional, basically the the usage of of ammunition and the intensity of the conflict and people affected. Um, it's it's the the largest uh, sort of conflict in in Europe since World War II. Um, thousands have been killed. We don't know the precise numbers now. Um, you know, some some in mass graves, uh, millions have been displaced, um, and uh, there's no, I mean, the material, forget about the material damage that it has caused. And there really isn't a very near end in sight. This war is going to go on, uh, to go on for some time. And as we are grappling, um, is there I see that there there's a problem with the audio. Can you can you hear me? Okay? We can hear you. Yes. All right, great. I can hear you. Wonderful. So as we're grappling with this the, these contemporary events, um, Ukraine's nuclear history uh, suddenly becomes more relevant and more interesting, and uh, we are revisiting it uh, today, but also Ukrainian people have been uh, have been thinking about this very hard, as have, uh, you know, kind of other actors and other uh, experts in in the field to think, A, what could have prevented this war from happening in the first place? Uh, what kind of role nuclear weapons play in this uh, in this conflict? Um, and also exactly what had happened in the early 1990s um, and what can be said for Ukraine's nuclear disarmament in, uh, in the decision to join the non-proliferation treaty in 1994. As most of you probably know, Ukraine inherited a chunk of Soviet nuclear weaponry uh, from the defunct Soviet Union in 1991. Uh, by 1994, Ukraine um, decided to relinquish any claim to this um, inheritance and um, join the treaty on the, on the NPT as a non-nuclear weapon state, but it, um, it negotiated by that time a deal. And part of the deal was uh, included a financial component, uh, which was the uh, compensation to Ukraine for the value of fissile materials contained in the warheads that it was relinquishing, um, you know, technical assistance and all sorts of other sort of indirect economic aid, but also um, 
uh, it negotiated a memorandum on security assurances uh, to Ukraine in connection with its um, uh, with its membership, with its ex uh, uh, with its accession to the NPT. A Budap the so-called Budapest Memorandum, signed in Budapest in, in December 1994, where the three depository states of the NPT, the United States, the UK, and the Russian Federation, pledged certain security commitments, right? There were reassurances, rather, to respect Ukraine's territorial integrity uh, and sovereignty, not to use uh, or threaten force against it, um, and the, the negative and positive nuclear related security assurance so npt related security assurance not to threaten uh or use nuclear weapons against ukraine and um uh, in in the case ukraine comes under the threat of nuclear weapons to seek assistance at the un security council in the wake still of 2014 annexation of Crimea and the, the beginning of the war in the Donbass when Russia blatantly violated these assurances under the Budapest Memorandum by by threatening and and actually changing uh, or affecting changes effective changes in Ukraine's borders and annexing part of its territory um, the the overwhelming mood in Ukraine translated into this narrative of regret of uh, sort of the the public narrative gelled into oh, we had the world's third largest nuclear arsenal and we gave it up for nothing. <laughs> you know, the, the bunch of security uh, assurances that, uh, or the Budapest memorandum that proved nothing but a piece of paper. Uh, and if we had nuclear weapons, Ukraine would not be suffering uh, this kind of breach of security. Um, and of course, you know, this <laughs> this breach came with a, with a renewed, um, kind of intensity and, uh, and renewed vengeance in uh, 2022 in February. In the West, rather, especially in 2014, when Ukraine got invaded um, and its territory was, territorial integrity was undermined, there was quite a bit of forgetting about exactly what did we sign in, in 1994? There was, you know, a community of people that were still part of the negotiating process, were either in administration or uh, as analysts, um, followed that process back in the day. Um, but, but you know, the they institutional memory in the United States is quite short. There's quite a change in, in personnel. There's a change in uh, administrations from uh, from one administration to another. And so there was quite sort of, um, uh, you know, pulling the Budapest memorandum out, out of a long history, out of a long drawer um, and brushing up and kind of revisiting exactly what Ukraine has been pledged at that time. Uh, there's also a bit of a narrative of, well, those weren't Ukrainian controlled weapons anyways. Russia maintained command and control. Uh, and essentially, those weren't even Ukraine's weapons to give up. As a historian who spent some time researching this subject and in various archives um, and writing a book about it, uh, my sort of conclusion, as it were, if there is one, is that uh, you know, some approximation to the truth of the matter, small t truth, is somewhere in the middle. That yes, Ukraine, uh, that no, Ukraine did not have command and control of these weapons. And this was certainly a chunk of nuclear inheritance or weaponry that was designed by a different country, the Soviet Union, for the strategic purposes of that country to deter NATO and the West. And yet, um, you know, Ukraine did have options. And I will, uh, as I go through this presentation, I will uh, discuss these options and also some of the main takeaways that um, that this book and this research uh, could offer and that might be helpful in understanding where we are today and what kind of maybe broader consequences this history bears for the international, for the global nuclear order, right, for the value of nuclear weapons in in the world. So, as I mentioned, um, you know, the Soviet Union fell apart in 1991. This map has all the strategic uh, nuclear weapons of the Soviet Union marked on it, both uh, these are basically assets that became uh, accountable under START, under the first START. So, both strategic missiles um, and uh, um, 
and uh, uh, strategic aviation and also the um, uh, some of the uh, the submarine bases, as well as some other major uh, testing grounds and such. Uh, and when the Soviet Union broke up, all of this massive nuclear um, installation, as it were, found itself overnight on a territory of not one, but four sovereign states, Russian Federation being one of them, and Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Ukraine being the other three. Um, of, the, of the three, Ukraine was quite well endowed with other elements of Soviet military industrial complex. It had a major missile building factory in Dnipropetrovsk and design bureau. Um, in Russian, it's usually design bureau in Yuzhmash. In Ukrainian, it's Pivdenne and Pivdenmash. It had indigenous uh, uranium uh, mining and milling, although it, it lacked uh, basically all the other subsequent L, uh, kind of links of the fuel, uh, nuclear fuel cycle. Um, it inherited 176 strategic missiles with about 1,200 uh, strategic nuclear uh, warheads accounted to them. It inherited uh, 44 strategic bombers, uh, the Tu-95s and the Tu-160s, the very same bombers that Russia uses today to um, uh, to bomb Ukraine, to 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 um, you know send barrages of of missiles. Um, uh, air launch cruise missiles against Ukraine, uh, the the Ha series, the HK, uh, the KH uh, series missiles. Um, Ukraine had some number of these KH series missiles. Uh, some of them nuclear tipped, and some of them conventional. Uh, about uh, about a thousand in total, of which it seems that about seven hundred were nuclear tipped. Um, and it had, you know, a robust kind of scientific know-how and infrastructure and many people who, and scientists who had clearances in, um, in the Soviet nuclear weapons project. So, um, uh, even though the strategic command and control of the missiles, uh, the strategic missiles deployed uh, here at Pervomaisk and at Khmelnytsky remained in Russia, for sure, I saw somebody post a comment that is not disputed at all that command and control contained in Russia uh, was was left in in the hands of Moscow. Let's let's say uh, at that time, Ukraine had what I like to say is a very handsome and a generous proliferator starter pack, right? Start a package. It had an option that. It could have turned with some investment and effort, it was a will and economic resources, into a deterrent, right? Uh, and, you know, it is it is a very difficult and deb debatable question of, of exactly how much and what uh, it would have had to do, but you probably know better than, uh, than anyone else that this technology, um, this, the, the technology, nuclear technology, technology of 1940s, right? It is, it takes <laughs> certainly uh, a certain specialized know-how, but it's by no means not accessible to the less developed countries. And, you know, the Pakistan and North Korea are a case in point in that, that with, with perseverance, uh, with some kind of commitment, even such underdeveloped countries that are strained economically uh, and otherwise could muster uh, a nuclear program. So the takeaway number one is that Ukraine did have options and it did have agency in this process, right? That beyond the actual weaponry, there was a large chunk of Soviet scientific and military industrial complex already in place that could have been leveraged for the for completing the missile links of the fuel cycle. Um, and, you know, warhead design and the kinds of delivery vehicles, you know, the, the aviation portion of it, of course, was could have already lended itself uh, um, to to being a, to serving as a deterrent. Um, and, you know, the, the, the sort of missiles uh, that could have served as a deterrent, you know, as a kind of launch vehicles for the deterrent uh, in Ukraine. Just as an anecdote and as, as an example, it's all often said, well, you know, there's a bit of, let me backtrack, there's a bit of kind of 
because there was a perennial conflation between Russia and the Soviet Union, right? We, even some of the most sophisticated thinkers and political leaders back in the Cold War would use these terms interchangeably, right? Soviet Russia, Russia, Soviet Union, Russian scientists. It obliviated the fact that the Soviet Union was more than just Russia. And when the Soviet Union fell apart, there was a bit of a surprise that as if, you know, the earth opened up and out came the Kazakhs and out came, you know, the Belarusians and the Georgians and the Ukrainians. And where were they before? We didn't, you know, we thought it was all Russia. Uh, well, they were there before and they were part of the project and, uh, and now had ownership over different parts of, of that military project. Uh, and yes, you know, the Russian uh, the Russian had quite a bit of transparency and penetration, what was going on in the, in the periphery and in, in the, these newly independent states. But all, that same thing was also true in the reverse. For instance, I just recently met a man who was the head for the, of the archive department for the Ministry of Medium Machine, Machine Building of the Soviet Union and then um, and then early, um, it was later restructured, but in the early days of, of, uh, of the post-Soviet period. Those who know the Ministry of Medium Machine Building was a cryptic name of Ministry of All Things Nuclear. There, there were people who were in charge of nuclear material, of warhead design, of all the labs, uh, and, uh, and so forth. He was in charge of the archival department of that ministry. He was Ukrainian national. He returned to Ukraine. He relinquished his post and returned to Ukraine in the early 90s. His daughter today works in DC for the for Voice of America, the Ukrainian service there. And he he told me that in the first couple of years of you know post-Soviet of the in the post-Soviet period, his badge would still let them through to that ministry it was pretty chaotic right he could still enter the ministry uh with his old soviet badge and nobody uh, you know took care of it nobody noticed so you know this is just one example of the many that were ethnic ukrainians working in in the labs and the Arzamas and, and so forth if there were a concerted will to uh, to leverage these connections and that uh, knowledge uh, in order to build up a Ukrainian uh, nuclear program, there would have been a way. In addition to this kind of the technical <laughs> tools that were uh, and the, the, the human capital that was in Ukraine's uh, command at the time, Ukraine had and tried to mount and perpetuate a claim to be a legitimate legal successor of the USSR in all respects. The Soviet Union ceased to exist. And for all intents and purposes, Russia, at least formally, was just as much uh, a successor state as all the other ones. And say in a conventional, conventional military domain, that succession was not contested. Whatever the tanks and the artillery and the air, aircraft were left on the territory of the constituent republics was theirs. And they had to, it had to be accounted, for instance, under the um, con Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty, which was multilateralized and, you know, proportionally those armaments were kind of allocated to each successor state and they were responsible then in, in the, reducing these conventional forces um, kind of in proportion to, to their inheritance. But because of the existence of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, the nuclear portion of this Soviet inheritance essentially fell under a different set of rules. It was a lot harder to argue Ukraine or other successors of, uh, of the USSR besides Russia had that claim to be a legitimate legal successor, right? Because there was one box for the USSR that was left uh, amongst the nuclear weapon states under the NPT, just one, and you, you couldn't make it four, <laughs> right? Because that would defy the very per object and purpose of the treaty is to, to stop the multiplication of nuclear states in the world, to, to stop uh, kind of proliferation. And so in this sense, then PT and that it was part and parcel of kind of the broader international uh, 
institutional structure, as it were, played a very important role in adjudicating and guiding and framing the whole issue of Soviet nuclear inheritance. So as Ukraine deliberated its choices, you know, we um, as political scientists and, uh, you know, less so historians, but certainly political scientists, they're trying to look for that one driver, like what drives proliferation or what drives nuclear renunciation? Well, the question is, normally it's a lot of things that happen in the same time. It's normally the connection between those two, those several things, rather than just one, you know, really salient driver. Um, and the whole nature of exercise of nuclear decision making exercise in Ukraine specifically you know throughout 1993 that was a very intense year of of deliberations internally and negotiations with the United States and Russia uh, in Ukraine over the fate of of this inheritance the whole nature of the exercise was to consider all the possible pros and cons all the possible you know, costs and benefits that would be associated with with the different um, options and and three options were considered in the internal kind of interagency um, deliberations in Ukraine. One was to disarm and join the NPT as a non-nuclear weapon state. Another one was to join nothing at all and to to retain those arms for now under Russian control and then see what we can do with them uh, sort of later on. Um, and the third one was to retain the to, to join the NPT and and uh, retain the portion of the delivery vehicles and see if you can retrofit them uh, strategic delivery vehicles uh, that that fall outside of start right because start uh, start one the strategic arms reduction limitations treaty to which Ukraine became um, party as uh, as a legal successor of the USSR was a reductions treaty. It was not, you know, a total elimination treaty. And so Ukraine would proportionally reduce its delivery vehicles, get, you know, transfer nuclear warheads to Russia to be in compliance with the NPT, but then fit sort of conventional, some sort of, um, you know, conventional warheads on the strategic delivery vehicles. So sort of a precursor to prom global strike, if you will. Um, and there were different kind of internal groups that were supporting uh, each one of these options, and I can uh, discuss that in more uh, detail in the Q&A. But it came down uh, to the fact that there were sort of pros and cons to each option, and, and there were some factors that were weighing uh, saliently in favor of nuclear retention, but there was also some very salient factors that were weighing, uh, weighing in the favor of disarmament um, and joining the NPT. For nuclear retention or deterrence or even hedging of some sort, there were security concerns. The relations with Russia soured almost immediately um, after the Soviet dissolution. And, you know, even though Russia's first president, Boris Yeltsin, said that Russia doesn't want to be an empire, wants to be an equal amongst equals and will treat everyone equitably in its you know, periphery. It's not going to be an empire. That proved to be very difficult to sustain, not just for Yeltsin, but also for, for the entire Russian political, uh, political uh, sort of uh, scene that had a real problem uh, accepting Ukraine as an independent state. It never really came to terms uh, with it for various reasons and these this kind of uh these tensions manifested itself both over the status of crimea which which many russians didn't like that it ended up uh as part of ukraine during the so after the Soviet dissolution the division of the black sea fleet station there in sevastopol um and the general kind of political weight and po geo geoeconomic weight uh, that russia could muster and leverage to keep ukraine in its sphere of influence um there were status concerns in 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 connection with that too uh the, the part of the reason why it was so important for ukraine to be sort of recognized at least formally as an equal to to Russia and, and to claim the Soviet succession is to exactly drive home the point that Russia is not the Soviet Union. It can't just monopolize this, you know, geopolitical space and these all of these international statuses that formally belong formally to to a whole collection of states, right? And Russia sort of seamlessly moved into those Soviet shoes, which <laughs> which were now too big for it to fill. And 
the, the concern was that eventually Russia will want to grow into the back right back into those shoes. And there are people in Ukraine right now who will say, I told you so. I was so surprised Ukraine is moving into uh, Russia is moving into Ukraine. There was also an element of keeping the, the US policy focus on Ukraine. Because as you can imagine, suddenly these new capitals, Minsk and Almaty and, and Kiev, that were non-entities on the on the US radar became, you know, sites of these very important uh, US delegations. And all of them arrived asking about nuclear weapons. You know, that those were capitals that would be completely omitted by US policy otherwise. So people in those capitals thought, well, if these things are so important to Americans, hey, maybe they're so maybe they should be important to us too. So there was sort of this inadvertent uh, kind of um, buffing of the value of this inheritance due to the single-minded focus of U.S. policy back then on the nuclear issue, right? Uh, and, you know, some of the people I talked to said, you know, back from that time said that there was a feeling that, you know, had Yugoslavia had nuclear weapons back in the day that the United States or Europe would not have allowed you know, it to descend into the bloody chaos of the Balkan Wars, that there would, would have been an early engagement and an early intervention to stop that, right? So um, so that was part part of the reason of, of sort of keeping, uh, kind of holding fast or trying to delay nuclear disarmament in Ukraine. And there, of course, were corporatists, the corporatists or kind of lobby interests, um, and they were the military, they, they, some 30,000 troops that were associated with strategic rocket forces in Ukraine. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, few or so with the aviation, but those were very elite and important military units that they understood <laughs> they would be out of a job, right, um, after the disarmament. And that, but, you know, although the military was very much, um, you know, had a very muted voice. It was, you know, Ukraine wanted to build civilian control over military. Um, and, you know, some of the old Soviet uh, kind of organizational cultures were helpful in that as well, where the military uh, was, you know, firmly under the, the control of the, the party and, uh, you know, the, the party related um, uh, institutions. But there was also defense industry. Uh, the Yuzhna Yuzhmash or Pivdana Pivdanmash in, in Ukrainian, and they were the ones pushing very strongly for, you know, not surprisingly, a conventionally armed ICBM. Here, they ran into, and that's something I will address in the second um, part of the table, um, in, in thinking about um, ballistic missiles that would work for Ukraine, um, and the ranges that would work to Ukraine. Ukrainians quickly ran into the issue of INF uh, because INF exactly prohibited the, the international uh, intermediate range uh, nuclear forces treaty, prohibited the ranges that would have been very useful to Ukraine if Ukraine wanted to build a deterrent, a missile based deterrent against Russia, right? 500 to 5,500 kilometers. So this is the underappreciated and unsung role of a treaty that was both in force and fully implemented. Um, you know, all the assets under INF have been destroyed by the time the Soviet Union fell apart, but the treaty was still in force. There was an inspections regime that was going on and Ukraine, again, as a successor state, to the USSR became party of that treaty and was limited by its ban. And so, one of the Ukrainian diplomats um, said, you know, as Ukrainian parliament tried to delay the ratification of START, um, you know, kind of delaying the, the issue of Ukraine's nuclear disarmament that way, he said, you know, we have been barking up the wrong treaty. You know, we've been trying to, to delay the ratification of START. Really, what is limit, what's limiting us in, in a very real way, if we were to go with this option, is the existence of the INF. And, and the range prohibition there. In addition to that, of course, there were other very salient factors that weighed in favor of disarmament. One was the, the experience and the trauma of Chernobyl. And it's hard to underestimate or underappreciate just how much of a widespread kind of anti-nuclear feeling and trauma 
uh, was still very much in force in the early 90s uh, in Ukraine. And it resulted in the, uh, you know, the, the inclusion in the, as Ukraine was still making its way to independent statehood and it passed the Declaration of Sovereignty still in July 1990, um, you know, a full year or more uh, before the actual formal dissolution of the Soviet Union. Uh, but was kind of an important part, an important document in uh, in in charting that way towards independent statehood. Ukrainian parliament unilaterally, under no pressure, there was no Russia, no the United States, inserted into that document the Declaration of Sovereignty, a pledge or a commitment or desire to become in the future a non-nuclear state that does not acquire or manufacture otherwise you know, acquired nuclear weapons, right? And at the same time, tried to, to kind of ban or the, uh, place a moratorium on the construction of civilian nuclear reactors and so forth. So in that sense, that kind of ultimate desire to disarm that stemmed from, from, the, um, from, from Chernobyl was already built into Ukraine's own a kind of state building document and that became kind of that that pin that you know pinned ukraine to its own uh commitment ultimately uh ukraine as many other uh post-soviet states was undergoing a major economic crisis so it, it would have lacked funds it would have been very difficult to divert funds from you know the the struggling economy to uh, to a nuclear weapons program um and it also relied very significantly on Western financial support and assistance and say the tranche from the International Monetary Fund to stabilize its currency or actually its temporary currency introduce a permanent one and so forth. So very quickly they understood if they wanted to develop, if they wanted to be part of a try and, and kind of uh, move towards kind of European models of development, the democratic society with market economy, that they A, couldn't do it very well without Western assistance, and they certainly couldn't do it if they were to uh, start building nuclear weapons, right? Uh, there was a concerted sort of a US-Russian condominium. Uh, the, the both countries shared an interest in making, uh, in having Ukraine disarm. Uh, so if you're a fledgling state, you know, you're Ukraine, you find yourself at a negotiating table across from, you know, two major nuclear powers and at least one of them in its unipolar uh, moment and having all sort of uh, levers of influence. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to actually, you know, stand your ground, no matter what your uh, legitimate uh, national interests might be. Um, there was also, um, and I'll discuss that in Q&A uh, a little bit, but amongst Ukraine's political leaders, there was a bit of grappling exactly what is this nuclear deterrence, right? Because when they thought about nuclear weapons, they thought about actually having to press the button, and they balked at the idea, right? So somebody not acculturated, not socialized into the deterrence theory, for example, as paradoxical as this theory is, right? If we think about it, like we're threatening the very thing we're trying to avoid from happening, they found that very difficult. And one kind of wonders <laughs> who's more sane in the in between those two modes of thinking. And you know, Ukraine's first president, Leonid Kravchuk. He basically couldn't convince himself he would carry out a deterrent threat, and how could be he, how could he be credible uh, to to others? At the bottom of the whole kind of pile of factors and issues that was I find extremely important to Ukraine at the time was the desire to join the international community on good terms. They realized very soon that if they they delayed the disarmament issue or even took it further as some kind of hedging or took it further as exploration in the nuclear um, direction of a nuclear deterrent, they would be isolated. They would not be integrated into Europe and international community, whether eventually they would become something like the North Korea of Eastern Europe or maybe something like Pakistan of Eastern Europe. 
it's it's a counterfactual. It, we we don't know that now, but they certainly realized that at that moment of great vulnerability, when they were building up their state institutions and and uh, you know free market economy, they uh, they basically faced a choice of whether to be a democratic society that's that's kind of integrated with the European uh, and transatlantic uh, structures in that way, or they be an autarkic and isolated regime, and they opted for. For the former rather than the latter. This is again, this is not to say that Ukraine did not have options. Making the right choice does not mean that you can't make a bad choice. And plenty of countries made bad choices. We see uh, the consequences of a bad choice uh, unfolding in Ukraine today. Uh, but I guess my point is we shouldn't shy from giving Ukraine credit for choosing the right path. Uh, right. Instead of saying, well, Ukraine didn't have any options anyways, it had, you know, an economic crisis and it didn't have command and control. There, there is a, if there is a will, there is a way. Takeaway two, um, something I'm going to breeze through because I'm running out of time. Um, uh, Ukraine did not enter an, uh, um, a world that was anarchical sometime and it was a free for all. There was an order in that world and the international non-proliferation regime was very much part and, par part and parcel of that order. And even people who didn't know much about the NPT, people who didn't think much of the NPT, uh, you know, let's remember it was before 1995, before NPT got extended indefinitely uh, at its review and extension conference. So there was quite a bit of doubt. They said, well, maybe that treaty won't even exist, you know, after 1995, we'll see. Um, they, they had to grapple, they had to grapple with its existence and also with the terms and definitions that what I call nuclear grammar that was built into that treaty. So what they, it provided only for two categories of states under the treaty, nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. And in non-nuclear weapon states, you could have West Germany and South Korea who had all sorts of nuclear capabilities and, you know, Zimbabwe. That, that was the category that subsumed everyone. And Ukraine tried to sort of say, well, this does not adequately account for the fact that we are a legal successor of one of the former nuclear weapon states under the treaty, right? We, <laughs> we are a legal successor in other domains. Why, why can we be denied, um, you know, any kind of recognition of that under this treaty? And that was very, very difficult. Um, again, because the treaty existed, because it had an object and a purpose, and you could not multilateralize that membership, Soviet membership um, under the treaty without kind of contradicting or defying its, its object and purpose. So it shaped the negotiations in a very significant way. And as I already mentioned, the existing uh, formerly bilateral arms control um, architecture, even multilateral like CFE has also shaped the way um, the way uh, parties approached uh, negotiating and uh, the disarmament, uh, it, the arms control act, our architecture actually provided quite a bit of transparency because under start many of these, uh, all of these assets actually, the bulk of them were declared. They were in Ukraine, uh, Belarus and Kazakhstan. So the West knew exactly what was there. There was some kind of spares and some other kind of free floating missiles that were either incomplete or uh, or spares that would also eventually be um, be cut up and, and disabled. But the bulk of that inheritance was accounted for because there was start right. Um, and it uh, and it had all these weapon systems um, accounted under it. And the takeaway number three is that the international relations deals like the Budapest memorandum are mostly what you make of them. There is the latter of the treaty, but in the states have quite a bit of leeway in interpreting their spirit. You, Ukraine did negotiate a deal and it negotiated hard with very little leverage. And, you know, basically with people who had to learn on the fly. I mean, people who did not deal with these strategic matters before, they had to be quick studies um, in, you know, kind of very elite uh, realm of nuclear weapons and, and arms control table negotiations and all of that. Um, it, but 
by way of, and actually the United States have become instrumental or was instrumental in getting that deal concluded in part because it did recognize Ukraine's legitimacy, something Russia sort of never did or did begrudgingly or did under sort of US beckoning and pressure. Uh, you know, the Russian stance was like, these are not even Ukrainian weapons at all. They belong to us because we're we're successors to the USSR under NPT. And, you know, Ukraine has no claim, so it should get nothing. But the United States was instrumental in, in recognizing Ukraine's demands, in, a, in negotiating compensation for the fissile material contained in the warheads and negotiating security commitments less than Ukraine wanted, but certainly more than Russia, uh, for instance, was willing to extend to Ukraine, which was nothing uh, in terms of, of, of kind of addressing Ukraine's security concerns. Uh, and uh, the less appreciated part of the deal was actually some very modest but still cooperation in the space domain with the Ukrainian missile makers who are still part of at least the Antares um, kind of, I think, it's a space delivery vehicle to the International Space Station. They they make some stages and modules for uh, for that spacecraft. So um, so in that sense, kind of the Pivde <laughs> was was allowed to to at least not die. Um, as uh, you know, as as kind of uh, and its missile making um, expertise continued. All of this, the fact that the deal was achieved at all, it was for Ukraine a recognition that these were Ukrainian weapons to give up, right? So that some kind of legitimate claim that Ukraine had to these weapons was recognized and sustained and compensated for. The, the security assurance part of it, the, the Budapest Memorandum, was neither the panacea for Ukraine's security, it was not an Article 5 guarantee, and even some NATO allies would say that Article 5 is not a panacea for their security, uh, nor was it, you know, nothing at all. It was not a worthless piece of paper, and I've been trying to argue it with Ukrainians as much as with everyone else. Um, it's it became part and parcel of the broader non-proliferation regime. And therefore its breach does have reverberations across the entire system, right? It was, at, Ukraine is a single country, actually, Belarus and Kazakhstan as well, uh, but they basically just got copy pasted the same type of memorandum that Ukraine negotiated. Ukraine is the only country that negotiated and whose accession to the NPT came with this kind of document in tow. Right, so it became part and parcel of the broader regime. Ukraine failed to leverage this document prior to 2014. It could have become the basis of a broader kind of security and defense cooperation with the United States and, and the UK. Um, Ukraine sort of rested on laurels. They said, oh, we got these, because of course they translated it into Ukrainian and Russian as security guarantees. And they said, we got a security guarantee from you know, Americans and the Brits, uh, we're good. <laughs> and that's not how it works. Um, and then, you know, when 2014 rolled along, they, many were surprised that no kind of forceful uh, action or some kind of salient response really followed from the West. Uh, and the United States, I think, and the UK kind of sidelined this agreement um, and this memorandum after 2014. Uh, again, it's what you make of it. They could have framed at least the, the military, the, the defense assistance that was provided to Ukraine in the course of the four years between 2014 and uh, 2022 as part of, of fulfilling the commitments under the memorandum, as in connection with like it would have been, it would have not done anything bad, <laughs> only, only kind of bolstered. Uh, the non-proliferation regime and, and showed that a country that disarmed, they gave up the option and did the right thing, you know, will not be left to stand alone, that it, it, it will, um, will be supported. Uh, and finally, very briefly, I know I'm out of time, uh, but just one minute, uh, what are the, the consequences of this history, perhaps going forward for the broader so-called global nuclear order?
And if we think of the global nuclear order, not only as the NPT and the non-proliferation regime and the system of these multi, um, you know, international institutions, but also something as a general set of rules and institutions and practices that govern possession, um, you know, use and development of nuclear weapons in the world, that we have to account also that part of global nuclear order is the system of deterrence and all the various dyads that exist in the world between the nine nuclear possessors. Um, it seems that the current war shows, gives a boost to the system uh, of nuclear deterrence. It shows the value of nuclear deterrence. Nuclear deterrence, you know, war broke out in a country that was not covered by one, didn't have a nuclear deterrent of its own, nor extended deterrence uh, by an ally, Ukraine. And, uh, you know, it was prosecuted under the shadow of nuclear threats that aimed exactly that, to conjure up the risk, uh, you know, specter of nuclear escalation and prevent Western countries from uh, either getting involved in the conflict directly, but also perhaps taking a very, very careful think uh, and look as to what kinds of systems and what kind of weapon systems they're extending to Ukraine, which is what we see has happened. As generous as the military support has been, it's been considered very, very carefully and for very good reasons by the, uh, by the Biden administration uh, as to its escalatory risks and often with a with the limitation on the end use of these systems and all of it is because deterrence works. At the same time, because of Ukraine's history of nuclear disarmament and the optics it creates, it's very unfortunate for the credibility of the uh, nuclear non-proliferation regime and raises questions. You know, if you do have a, a kind of aggressive belligerent neighbor that's bigger, conventionally stronger, you know, it's not a question of whether if you have a war with that, with that neighbor and with your grit and, and all the international support, if you can still prevail, you know, after two, three years of bloody war and inflict great casualties on that adversary. The question is, well, you know, thousands of people that you lose in the process, they cannot be brought back to life. Um, Thousands of women that were raped in this conflict cannot be unraped. A whole generation of kids traumatized by missile strikes that is growing up in bomb shelters cannot be untraumatized that way. And the question becomes, what could have prevented this in the first place? Right? So, you know, my job as someone who has kind of staked her um, life's work in saying that Ukraine did the right thing, that nuclear weapons are not a, you know, an answer to world security pro uh, problems. And then in the end, we should all make, make an effort uh, to reduce their salience, to reduce their role in international security. My job has gotten a lot harder in the wake of this war. Thank you so much.